Hi, y'all, and welcome. This is Professor Trulove's Concepts for Nurses series, and I am Professor Terry Trulove. And in this episode, part of the orthopedic series of concepts, we will review bone tumors, Paget's disease of the bone, osteomyelitis, scoliosis, and muscular dystrophy. Sources for this episode include Iggy's Medical Surgical Nursing, 9th edition, and Sol's Introduction to Critical Care Nursing, 7th edition. Bone tumors, whether they are benign or malignant in nature, both alter the normal structure of the bone. And although the first sign that a patient may be suffering from a bone tumor is usually pain, unfortunately, it is often asymptomatic, usually discovered by a routine x-ray or as a cause of a pathologic fracture. And it has to be differentiated between bone cancer. Remember, benign, we don't know the source of those tumors. However, malignancies can either be a primary bone cancer or secondary to some other type of cancer. Interventions include non-drug pain relief measures and drug therapy such as analgesics and NSAIDs. Non-drug pain relief measures include positioning, uh, com complementary and alternative therapies, and it may be that surgical therapy is going to be required, including removal of the cancerous area or the tumor, joint replacement therapy, and atherodesis or bone grafting. Interventions for bone cancer are similar in that there is removal of the tumor, and couturage, by the way, means removal of part of that tissue or cap away from the cavity by using a correct uh, small surgical instrument that sort of scrapes. Uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy are also indicated for bone cancer, and of course, psychosocial resources because the patient will be suffering from loss. Paget's disease or Paget's disease of the bone is a metabolic disorder. Uh, involving bone remodeling, that is turnover, um, this is because of increased reabsorption. Uh, remember that the process of reabsorption is where the osteoclasts break down bone and release the minerals, resulting in a transfer of calcium from bone fluid to the blood. All right, so this results in a overall loss of bone and deposits that are disorganized, enlarged, and very weak. Non-surgical management medication, calcitonin, selective biophosphates, mithrancin, sur surgical management would have to do a tibial osteotomy or a partial or total joint replacement. So to review it, it is an imbalance of increased osteoblast and osteoclast cells, causing thickening and hypertrophy. Bone pain is the most common symptom. Bone enlargement and deformities are usually bilateral. Kyphosis often occurs, and usually it affects the long bone. Again, the medications are going to be pain control, so analgesics. Biophosphates and calcitonin to try to increase the strong mineral deposits. NSAIDs to decrease inflammation. They'll need assistance devices, and they also respond well to hot and cold treatment. When the bone itself gets infected, this is known as osteomyelitis, therefore a local or generalized infection of the bone and bone marrow. The most common cause are staphylococci. It's usually introduced through trauma, that is injury or surgery, or by the bloodstream from another site. In other words, you have a blood-borne infection, it infects the bone. Bacteria invade the bone, and then degeneration of the bone occurs. Clinical manifestations of osteomyelitis include a persistent, severe, and increasing bone pain, wound draining, especially purulent fluid discharge, signs and symptoms of infection including fevers greater than 101 degrees Fahrenheit, tachycardia and tachypnea, erythema and edema on the affected area where the infection is, elevated levels of leukocyte or leukocytosis, and elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So, your diagnostic test should include radiology studies, including a bone scan, CBC, as I said, ESRs, and culture and sensitivity. So, medical management includes pharmacological management, antibiotic therapy, but remember, it's going to be hard to get the antibiotics because how lightly vascularized much of the bone is. Bone marrow is a different animal. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy has shown a lot of promise in preventing bone loss. Absolute rest of the expected extremity. In some cases, the 
Infection kills off the bone, causing necrosis, and surgical removal is then required. You need to irrigate the, with the wound with hydrogen peroxide or an antibiotic solution, and cover with sterile dressing. Maintain drainage and secretion precautions, and your dietary recommendations are, should be a diet high in calories, high in proteins, and with vitamins, particularly vitamin D. Scoliosis is one of the curvatures of the vertebrae. Scoliosis occurs when the vertebrae rotate and begin to compress. The spinal cord moves laterally. As the degree of curvature increases, damage to the vertebral bodies results. There are three types of descriptions for scoliosis. Uh, congenital, which of course occurred during the embryonic development. Neuromuscular, such as cerebral palsy or spinal cord tumors, which cause weakening of the supporting muscles. But the most common cause is unknown or idiopathic. Other ways to describe it, so if it's the problem in the spine itself, some of the deviations within the spinal column, we call that a structural problem. But if it's something like from a muscular skeletal disorder, then we call that a non-structural cause or a source of scoliosis. The treatment of scoliosis depends on the severity of the deformity. Uh, it can be as simple as exercising or a brace and can extend all the way to requiring surgical intervention. One of the most important factors is early diagnosis and treatment. Another important musculoskeletal problem is muscular dystrophy. This is characterized by varying degrees of skeletal muscle weakness and degeneration. This leads to disability and deformity, and it can be either slowly or rapidly progressive. And the exact source, the exact cause of muscular dystrophy is not well known. Treatment for muscular dystrophy include physical therapy, the use of orthosis or braces. In some cases, particularly for the ruptured vertebrae, surgical fusion may be needed, or in some cases, the patient will also have contractures, so surgical release of contractures would therefore be indicated. The nurse should monitor cardiac and endocrine systems, remind the patient and the family that there is no cure and that care would be supportive. Steroids and immunosuppressants have been shown to delay the symptoms. Genetic counseling is required for patients who, or families who are planning to have babies. And the patient with muscular dystrophy should avoid strenuous exercise because the fatigue will worsen the symptoms. So with all musculoskeletal disorders, priorities include control of contracture, managing pain, maintaining mobility impairment, and nursing care that is common to all of these is maintaining safety. Ultimately, the nurse has to consider the patient's safety. These patients are at risk for airway and breathing problems and from all of the complications that are related to things like immobility. That is, GI problems, nutritional problems, elimination problems, skin problems. That does conclude this episode. I hope you learned a little bit on this episode. I hope you plan on coming back and listening to some more. And if you are, we'll see you then. You take care now.